we'll get started and other people I'm sure will come in um, as I give my introduction. Uh, and I begin today by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am speaking. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I also extend that respect to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I'm really delighted to be opening what is now the second session of History Books at UNSW, a new series where we discuss and celebrate the latest releases from historians at the University of New South Wales. Today, we're celebrating Martin Lyons' new work, Dear Prime Minister, Letters to Robert Menzies, 1949 to 1966, which is out with New South Press this month. Martin Lyons is Emeritus Professor at UNSW, and he's been an incredible asset to our school and the Australian history community since he started here in 1977. Dear Prime Minister is the latest of Martin's impressive list of works that offer richly detailed and precise analyses of writing culture and practice, with previous titles including The Writing Culture of Ordinary People in Europe, 1860 to 1920, and Reading Culture and Writing Practices in 19th Century France, amongst many others. It's also his second book for this year, and follows on from the Typewriter Century, A Cultural History of Writing Practices, which is released in February. Today, Martin will be in conversation with another influential and very familiar historian of Australian cultural history, Richard White, Emeritus Professor at the University of Sydney. Richard also has a forthcoming work for New South Press, Symbols of Australia Imagining a Nation, co-edited with Melissa Harper, which is out next month. Um, this is a revised and updated edition of the 2010 publication, and revisits symbols used to define and represent the nation 11 years on from the publication of the original edited collection. Before uh, turning to the main event, I'll just give a brief rundown of our format for today. Uh, Martin and Richard will be in conversation for around 30 minutes, and then we'll open up for audience questions. Um, so feel free to start indicating that you'd like, a to, like to ask a question from around 30 minutes in, uh, but I'll also give you a reminder at that point. Um, to indicate that you'd like to ask a question, just use the raise hand function here that'll tell me that, which is in the right, sorry, the bottom right of your screen on Zoom. Um, and that'll tell me that you'd like to answer, ask a question. Uh, but if you'd also, if you prefer to type a question rather than asking one, that's absolutely fine as well. And I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, so without anything further from me, I'll hand over to the main event. Uh, Richard White, go ahead with the interview. Uh, thanks very much, Naomi. Um, and yes, I'd like to acknowledge the custodians of the land that I'm on up in the Blue Mountains, the Darug and uh, Gundungurra people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And, um, and thank you, Martin, for inviting me to um, do this. I feel very honoured to be um, interviewing you about what is such um, a fascinating um, book. Um, I feel I'm channeling Richard Feidler here a bit. Uh, Martin, of course, well, certainly now needs no introduction because <laughs> Naomi's just covered it um, thoroughly. But um, as she said, I mean, her, his, well, one of his great contributions has been in the history of um, reading and writing practices um, and, and the mechanics um, of writing production. Um, and all those books, including the most recent, um, The Typewriter Century, um, demonstrates that, that expertise and enthusiasm. And it's that expertise that he brings to his analysis of letters written to Robert Menzies um, as Prime Minister, um, looking at this letter writing as social practice um, and what it can say about the society um, that produced it. Um, and needless to say, for someone um, interested in the art of writing, um, it's the, the book is, I have to say, it's very well written um, and very entertaining. Um, we're, we're told, for example, um, that men's is wasn't immune to uh, the fragrant oil of flattery, lovely <laughs> phrase. And um, at another point, um, that he apparently, quote, had little use um, for a monkey skin that uh, one of his correspondents um, offered to send him. Um, as it says on the front cover, here it is, by the way, um, as it says on the front cover, um, and I think I have to agree with this, it's an elegantly wry testament to a lost era of letter writing. Um, and, and in addition, and um, this, uh, this is more than can be said for 
uh, many of the letter writers in the book, Martin's spelling is excellent. <laughs> um, but to begin, um, Martin, maybe um, could you just say something about what these letters are as a, a sort of corpus, as a body of material for a historian to get their um, teeth into? Uh, yes, okay. Well, they're about, well, I estimate there are about 20 odd thousand of them. I've gone through about 20,000 myself. There is, I know there are some gaps and so I think there are some more out there that have been lost at some stage in the 50s. Um, there's a whole lot of letters that I didn't look at about invitations to Menzies for to private functions, uh, speaking invitations. I didn't go through those. So there's maybe many more than that that I've actually you know, looked at. There may be 25,000 or so. Um, the letters that come from anybody, uh, they come from the from the great and famous. They come from um, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, and they come from, and this is what I'm mostly interested in, uh, ordinary people, ordinary voters uh, from all over Australia and even and overseas as well. Um, they come into Menzies Secretariat, which is a very small secretariat usually just a couple of people for most of the well actually yeah for most of the period it sometimes gets a little bit larger when business is hectic but only a couple of people and um they're beautifully uh they're beautifully filed richard they're you know they're 80 or 90 odd boxes of wonderfully organized material sorted year by year in alphabetical order of the sender's name and so on um so uh, very easy to deal with but there's a lot of them. So just how did you go about dealing with so many? Well, well, I looked through the whole lot of them um, and I've drawn on the whole lot all the way through the book. So, uh, so there wasn't really any selection there, but for certain specific questions that I wanted to answer about the senders, who they were, where they came from, what gender they were and so on, and uh, specific questions about the letters also, the, the material quality of the letters, were they typewritten, were they handwritten, how long were they, um, how, what sort of paper did they use, um, and also what sort of terms of address, how did they address Menzies. For those sorts of questions, um, I, I took samples of three years. The first year, 49 to 50, um, a year in the middle, I think it was 58 from memory, and 64 towards the end. And for those three years, I logged every letter um, onto my rather crude spreadsheet with about 13 or 14 columns with, with the answers to those particular questions uh, right. in them. That's how I did it. Yeah. Okay, well, let's um, turn to who wrote them. Um, I mean, there's an incredible range of people as in the book. I mean, you, you know, poly, all, all sorts of political complexions, um, class perspectives. Um, so how would you categorise the sort of writers? Well, as I've said, um, they were mainly men. And men rather than the individual letters, at least, were sort of men were in the majority, perhaps 70 to 30, but sort of big majority, which is obviously not representative of the whole population, but perhaps representative of letter writers. That's a practice which has historically been very heavily male dominated, which is, um, yeah, uh, I think that's, that's certainly true. Um, they come from all social levels. Um, of course, not everyone tells you exactly what their profession or their background is, but a lot of them are, do give quite a bit of autobiographical material. So they come from all, all levels. Um, but then you said all political complexions, but they're mainly from liberal voters. Um, so uh, there are some Labour, there are some Labour voters, and they usually write 
to argue against the abolition of the Communist Party, that, the dissolution of the Communist Party. That's the subject that, that where, where you see a lot of uh, trade unions and um, uh, Labour voters writing in. But normally it's Liberal voters. So I'm not trying to say this is a, uh, a representative picture of Australian opinion as a whole. There's a, really a whole block of the political spectrum that is not fully represented here. Uh, but I mean, Catholics were happy to write to him, as well as Protestants, weren't they? Yes. Certainly, and there's a lot of sectarian uh, bitterness uh, in the correspondence from both sides, from both those sides. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was actually interested in um, the the fact that women were in such a minority because I mean, Menzies was supposed to have such a rapport with women, and you know, much of his um, success, you know, a lot of people would argue was based on his appeal to women. I think I don't think I don't think the correspondence would would contradict, you know, contradict that. I mean, I think I think there's evidence that that that, that was true. And um, he was very good at cultivating it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he used the radio very well for this purpose, I would say. Not so much television. He didn't like television, although he had to get used to it. Um, but he used the radio and, and he would he would talk to this sort of rather elderly female constituency, I think, uh, mainly through that medium and when they wrote in to say what you know what a wonderful speech i really enjoyed listening to you on the radio he knew exactly what to say he said he would say yes i'll think next time i'll be thinking of you listening uh, as i talk so it was he tried to sort of construct those radio talks as a as a one-to-one -one conversation with this female constituency yeah yeah and um uh, so i mean do you think in some they they fit the forgotten people that he was so famously defined as a, a sort of category of a, a threat? Yes, um, I think a lot of them do. Um, they're, I, I, I don't know how you would characterize them exactly because we've got the forgotten people as a rather vague category in sociological terms. Um, Intentionally, presumably. <laughs> No, no doubt, no doubt. But there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, writers, pensioners, who don't quite fit. They thought they were forgotten, but I'm not sure that they were the ones who Menzies had in mind when he spoke to the his his forgotten people. But I mean, one of the, one of the themes I wanted to emphasise in this book, one of the things that really struck me was the um, the consistency and the longevity of the letters from pensioners complaining about their lot it, it just goes on and on right through the period and they're they're still they're still doing it even when Menzies is stepping down yeah in a way that was one of the big surprises wasn't yeah. it? you know that that you know the dominant issue or the the most common issue discussed was pensions that's that's what i think yes and it certainly did surprise me i mean that there are plenty of letters dealing with more predictable things like, um, well, anti-communism, for example, um, and also plenty of letters which reflect um, the link with Britain and Britishness, the British part of Australian identity, which Menzies seemed to personify. Um, but um, it, those themes sort of have their moments and then they sort of fade away. But the pension theme keeps going and it, 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 it comes back every time at, when the budget is being prepared. OK, when the budget is being prepared, people write in and say, please put in a pension, pension rise into the budget. And when the budget comes out, they write to say, why didn't you do something or why didn't you do something more? And it just goes on. Yeah, yeah. And you um, get some really quite moving hard luck stories from the pensioners themselves about the the, 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 the difficulties of trying to exist on, on a meagre pension. Yeah, and both the level of the pension, but also the means test. The means the, test, the yes. Other. And they, the means test... voters would have been, yeah, particularly interested. They were particularly interested in that. They saw that the means test as, a, as I think, as a, some kind of betrayal of the values that, that they thought Menzies was defending because the means test... Um, seemed to be penalizing the people who who'd been sweating and saving mm. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they objected to that. Yeah. Exactly yeah. meant his yeah. constituency. Yes. 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 Um, and what sort of while we're on that, um, what about issues that surprised you in that they didn't come up as much as you might have imagined? Well, that's right. You have to look, when you're looking at any correspondence, body of correspondence, you have to think about, you know, what's not there, what's being left out. And uh, I guess the most striking thing, obviously, is the absence of very much consideration of uh, uh, Indigenous questions, Indigenous affairs. Um, the, the, um, letters on um, anything touching on Aborig Aboriginal people are very, they're very, very rare. I mean, there are some, but they're very rare. And whenever it does come up, of course, Menzies' reply is always, that's a state matter, it's not a federal matter. Um, that's, that's his get out. And of course, it was technically true. Um, although it, it meant, you know, he wasn't going to do anything about any problem in that area. Yeah, actually, I mean, one very disturbing one was the one that was seeking a royal commission into, you know, um, historical injustice. Indeed, what, indeed. Tell us what happened to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't remember what did happen to oh. that. Nothing very much. Nothing well, very much. Um, no, um, the secretary passed it on to the security service. Oh, uh, uh, this one, yes. Yes. There was one that was passed on to ASIO. Yes, indeed. Now you've reminded me of something yeah. I should have remembered. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry to bring that in. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, that, that would have been fairly unusual, though. That was. that. I, I couldn't really explain that. I mean, yeah. it seemed to be um, really out of proportion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, I wonder... I want, unless ASIO already knew about the writer, maybe, or I don't know. Anyway, um, so uh, we've yes, we've looked at some of the um, the issues. Oh, one one interesting thing was that quite a lot of non Australians were were writing to Menzies about all sorts of things as well. What about them? Who are yes, they? there were many of those. I mean, in my in the samples I took, the sampled years I mentioned earlier about maybe 20%, roughly speaking, of the letters came from uh, overseas. And most of those, not surprisingly, came from Britain um, and other Commonwealth countries. I um, that was where Menzies' network was. Um, I suppose the conventional expectation would be that they came from uh, Tory politicians and uh, uh, English uh, businessmen looking for investment opportunities, and that's certainly true. There were plenty of those, but that's not the whole story. There were there were letters also from quite um, ordinary British people interested in emigrating. They wanted advice and help on on uh, how to get an assisted passage. Um, there were plenty of those, and the letters from the letters from Britain and also from elsewhere in the Commonwealth. Um, seemed to, uh, there were more of them in the 60s when the South African apartheid issue came to the fore. Uh, not only South African, but the Southern Rhodesian issue. I mean, after 64, when Harold Wilson told the Rhodesians they had to introduce one man, one vote. Um, there are a lot of letters from Britain at that point, and they're really asking Menzies to save them from their own government because they regarded Macmillan as having sold out the empire. And he, they accused Macmillan of listening only to the black statesmen uh, of the black African nations. Um, and, they, and they saw Menzies as the sort of savior of this, of this uh, the one who could save this vision that they had of the old um, white settler um, British empire. Um, he was seen to them, you know, the the leader, the true leader of the empire in those days. Yes, Churchillian was the yes, wasn't it? Yes, <laughs> um, but again, you know, a select um, <laughs> proportion of the population. Indeed. Yeah. Um, now, I think I mean one of the most interesting aspects of the of these sorts of letters is that. Uh, the, what, what you talk about is writing upwards, um, ordinary people writing to 
leaders and um, you're able to put it in, put these letters to Menzies in the context of quite a range of works that's been done on, um, on letters to other leaders such as, um, well, Hitler and Mussolini, um, and um, I think you know, Stalin, and um, also Mitterrand and De Gaulle and um, mm -hmm. Obama. Yes. Um, how does Menzies fit a? How does Menzies fit into that sort of category of writing up? And um, B, uh, are there differences between writing up to an autocrat and writing up to a democratic? elected uh, leader? Uh, yes, I, well, I think Menzies actually fits in very well with that in that company. Uh, is a, um, although um, compared to Mitterrand and certainly Obama, the scale is rather different. I mean, Menzies, as I said, had got about 20, 22,000 letters in 16 years. Well, Obama got that many in two or three days. Um, and he had a massive secretariat, a massive team of people to deal with them. So the scale is rather different. But nevertheless, um, I think things are fairly similar. What, uh, uh, well, let me say, first of all, yes, that, uh, you're suggesting there's a difference between letters to somebody like Obama or Menzies, um, an elected uh, leader in a, a constitutional parliamentary democracy, there's a difference between that and somebody writing to the Tsar of Russia or, or Hitler or Mussolini. Yes, I, I, I think there is a difference in, in the sense that the people writing to Menzies felt they had some entitlement, they felt they had some power, they had the power of the vote, and they frequently threatened not to vote for Menzies. Of course, that was that was the hold they had over him, and that's why they told him he had to listen to their opinion. Otherwise, of course, he would be voted out. So that's certainly, there's a difference in tone there, yes. But I do think the, uh, I, I do think there are similarities that run right the way through, regardless of the the kind of leader we're talking about. This applies to Menzies, this, um, this applies to uh, Mussolini, and this applies to the Tsar of Russia. People who wrote assumed that they could get the direct access to the man, and it is a man, at the top. Um, they thought they, by writing, they could activate the sort of the hotline to the leader. And if they could only get the leader's attention, Right. He he could see what the problems were. He could see the problems that, that, that the the bureaucratic tangles that had developed and he could put things right. And I think that sort of idea um, of direct access solving all the problems is, is 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 something that runs through writing upwards in in uh, in any kind of regime. Um, yeah, uh, one um, element in writing upwards to um, autocrats, of course, is also denunciation, letters of denunciation of names. Yes. Were there any um, letters like that to Menzies? There were a few. There were a few. Um, yeah, a, a little bit shocking to me, but yes, there were a few uh, anti-communist denunciations around about the mid-50s. Um, people writing to denounce their employer or their past employer who possibly had dismissed them against whom they maybe had a grudge as a result. Um, uh, and one or two people rather suspicious of their neighbor who was receiving some Chinese visitors, which warranted a, a letter to Menzies um, as a warning. There are a few of those, certainly, yeah. And a lot of them were, they maybe were referred to ASIO and most of the time ASIO apparently, as far as I can tell by what I was reading in the correspondence, reported that there was absolutely no basis on which to proceed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose actually that brings us to um, another aspect of, of your categories, I suppose, the, the way you've categorised the sorts of people writing. You have 
more or less five categories of letters, I think. Um, do you remember what they are? <laughs> well, there were congratulatory letters to start with. They're the most obvious ones and the most straightforward ones. That people who wanted to congratulate Menzies um, on, on his birthday um, or on winning an election, which he did with great regularity, as you know. Um, there were letters, um, what I call supplicatory letters, letters asking for a particular favour, um, people asking for the, their telephone connection to be speeded up, um, people asking for almost anything, people asking for a loan of money, um, people uh, asking for help in a custody battle against the spouse, um, people asking for any old clothes. Dear Mr. Mendes, have you got any old clothes you could send me to help me through the winter? And at the other end of the social scale, you know, people asking for a ticket to the Royal Garden Party or, or uh, the Escot race meeting or something like this. Um, then there are letters which are, which, where there are what I call homiletic letters. There are sermons of people. This is what I think you don't get in letters to Hitler, Mussolini, or the Tsar of Russia, people preaching to Menzies, telling him how he had to keep on the straight and narrow path um, and keep Australia on the straight and narrow path, otherwise doom would follow. Um, there are those sermon letters, and there are a few paranoid letters of, from, from people who, who thought the, the Freemasons were about to destroy the world or, or, or something of this nature. Um, and there were sort of letters which were warning Menzies that if he didn't change his policy, these are, well, these are sort of political letters, letters from the, the grassroots of the parties, warning Menzies that if, if so, so, such and such a policy wasn't changed, uh, the Labour would win the next election, so you better beware. And they, they, the writers, knew about this because they were at the grassroots, they were experiencing what ordinary voters were feeling, and they were reporting this to Menzies. Um, there were also letters interestingly reprimanding Menzies um, for bad behavior. There were occasions when Menzies uh, apparently was behaving badly. For example, and most, not most notably um, in his uh, sp speeches and um, dialogue, if that's the word, with, with Everett, the, the, the Labour leader. When Everett was really down, people told Menzies, stop kicking a man when he's down. You're being vindictive. You're being excessive. This is not how a great statesman should behave. You should be more magnanimous. This, I think this is quite interesting. It shows that you know some Liberal voters had sort of standards of courtesy in politics, um, and, they, and they held Menzies accountable when he lapsed from those standards. Yes, that's very much um, Judy Brett's argument about that, that constituency that Menzies had, you know, of, mm -hmm. of decent people, you know, people who saw themselves as standing up for decency. And they stood up for decency, yes, sir. unlike the Labour Party riffraff, yes, in their view, yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. yes. Um, so what, what, what surprises were there for you? What surprises? Um, well, we've mentioned the pension theme. Um, the materials, the materials sort of surprised me from time to time. Um, like, the, for instance, I mean, people wrote on almost anything. Um, they, I mean, there's one, one, I think he was a bus conductor who just, who wrote a letter on just uh, a, a, a torn piece of brown wrapping paper. Uh, it didn't matter. You could write to Menzies on, on anything you like. Um, there was also a wonderful Japanese scroll, um, which I unraveled with great, very tentatively because it's rather fragile object. I think it was on mulberry tree paper. That was very striking. I think that was a translated and it was, um, a petition in the early 50s for the release of um, Japanese soldiers who were imprisoned, prisoners of war on Manus Island, suspected of being war criminals. They were released soon after that, I think. Um, what impressed me also, maybe most of all, was the struggle, the struggle for 
for literacy. Um, the struggle to write a letter, which for many people was clearly an unfamiliar and difficult task. Um, they, they didn't have a very high degree of what I would call epistolary literacy. In other words, they didn't know exactly the, all the rules and conventions of letter writing. Um, they, they, their spelling was, let's say, um, idiosyncratic. They were, let us say, liberated from the burden of punctuation. Um, uh, those sorts of letters were the ones I, uh, I, I was surprised by, but I was very interested in because, it, I mean, it showed that it, it didn't really matter how literate you were. Um, the impulsion to write overcame everything. Yeah. And how did they address him? They, some of them addressed him very familiarly. I mean, dear Bob, sometimes in inverted commas. I mean, they didn't know him. They didn't know him personally. Dear Bob, uh, dear Big Bob. Um, uh, mostly it was uh, dear Mr. Menzies. Um, but after he was knighted, it became a bit more formal. It, it was Sir Robert. Dear Sir, dear Sir Robert became very, very... Um, it became the most, you know, the favourite form of address. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe to sort of wind up, um, you talk about um, structures of belief um, of the society that these letters um, can provide an insight into. Um, would you just like to say something more about the problems for historians in pinning down that sort of idea of structures of belief of the society yeah yes well it is difficult i agree um, um i was sort of i sort of had in mind uh, in the back of my mind um the the anal concept of mentalities here um i didn't use the word because it's a problematic concept and it's become a little bit obsolete but but <sighs> Uh, one of the things I take from that idea uh, is that the, the, the structures of belief, or the beliefs or the mentalities, whatever we call them, are to some extent unconsciously expressed. Um, I was trying, to some extent, we're trying to find not just what the letters explicitly uh, say. That's not just, if it was just that, the task wouldn't be so hard. Um, but you're looking also, I think, for the unspoken assumptions, the things that the letter writers take for granted, and they don't always spell out, um, or at least if they do, they assume that whoever they're writing to is going to agree completely with those assumptions. So, so that's what I think I was trying. To, I was looking for the 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 assumptions, the sort of the the building blocks in their in their in their rhetoric and the uh, the things they were not always absolutely clear about then then a lot of things come through the 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 tendency to believe in conspiracy theories the the christian foundation also of a lot of the things they were saying those sort those sorts of things uh, they're hard to pin down but you've got to use a bit of imagination usually Okay, well, um, at that point, uh, Naomi, do you want to come in and conduct <laughs> question yes, and answers? Certainly. Thank you so much, Richard and Martin, um, for the delightful and really rich conversation. I'm currently analysing um, or have been analysing a thousand petitions written um, in Sri Lanka to the British government in the 1830s, so totally different context, but another form of writing upwards. And so I'm sort of bursting with questions at the moment, but I will um, hold off and open up to the audience. So please do put your hands up uh, if you have something to ask. Uh, Peter, straight away. Uh, just unmute yourself, Peter. Bueno. Um, thank you, Martin, for that. It was most interesting. It reminded me of uh, letters to Peron uh, in the early 50s and the late uh, uh, 40s. Um, but the difference would be, I suppose, that 
uh, people were encouraged in Argentina to write to Peron. Um, and this for a couple of reasons, uh, most importantly, uh, to gather ideas for the second five-year plan, the first five-year plan ending in 1951. Uh, but also perhaps to encourage women uh, to be more involved because they uh, had only just got the vote. So 1952 elections uh, were uh, the first uh, uh, national elections where women, Argentine women could vote. Um, I was just wondering whether in, Argent in Australia, people were encouraged as they were in Argentina to write letters. Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me still? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that, that goes for a lot of the, the examples that we mentioned earlier. I mean, Mussolini, for instance, encouraged people to write to him. And, and he even collected together a collection of the most obsequious ones and published them to show, you know, the loyalty of the people. Um, and, and certainly, um, uh, Mitterrand uh, explicitly invited people to send in letters. He wanted them to write. And I think I don't know if Mendes uh, did actually that, but he did. There was an encouragement. Uh, there certainly was an encouragement because I think people people saw Menzies as somebody who valued writing. Who he was a sort of a, a literary sort of person. He had literary tastes. He uh, respected the written word, and. Um, I, I think yes, and I, I think governments used these letters. They they they, they regarded them as important. Um, people people wrote because they knew Menzies would consider their letters of some importance. Um, nowadays, I think that's probably not the case, mm -hmm. and that's why I think you know Richard was right to call this a lost era of letter writing. Mm -hmm. And. John. Marcus, John. Oh, John. Were there um, were there letters sent to Menzies about conscription? I mean, this is a this is an issue that irritated a lot of people. And those of us who were around about the time remember campaigning and barracking and et cetera, et cetera. Did people send him letters uh, opposing the, the government's view on conscription or on uh, foreign policy generally? Uh, I don't remember anything about conscription. Uh, I don't remember anything at all about conscription. That's interesting because I do remember sending a letter myself. <laughs> uh, I didn't address him as Sir Robert. I can't remember. It would have been something uh, unkind, but it was sent back to me. <laughs> and uh, I, now, well, that's why I didn't. That's why I didn't read it, John. Yeah, but what, but what is there any note on the file somewhere about what they, which letters they kept and which ones they flicked somewhere else, or the ones they sent back, or whatever you know, all the other things that. Is this just a selective group that they wanted to keep and the other ones, who knows? No, well, I don't know why any letters should be sent back to the sender because there's many of them, uh, many inquiries uh, were sent to the relevant ministry or government department. Letters about immigration were passed on to the Ministry of Immigration. A letter about conscription would have gone, I, sub, I don't know, to the Ministry of Defense. Or, um, and there's a record, there's a record of that transfer. Yes, but I, I'm not sure why a letter would be sent back to the author. That's, that's news to me. Ian. Um, uh, I found that very interesting, Martin, I must say, I'm sorry I came in a little late, so you may have covered this uh, aspect of the question I'm about to ask, but uh, I'm as interested in Menzies' replies as the letters he received. Uh, yeah. Did he reply to the letters or do you yeah. have the copies of the letters? One of the most, that's a very, thank you for asking that, Ian, I'm, 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 I'm grateful because you just reminded me uh, to, to make this point. One of the most striking things I found about the correspondence is there's an enormous reply rate. They did get a reply. Mm -hmm. um, in the sample years that I mentioned before, 75 to 80% of letters got a reply from the secretariat, which I think is remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the reply was very 
cursory. Um, it, if somebody wrote, for instance, complaining about the pensions or, or some issue of that sort, the, the reply would be something like, thank you for your practical interest in this problem. Um, there, was, there were sort of some formulas which in the replies which keep recurring. Um, sometimes if somebody wrote to tell Menzies, for example, that uh, Khrushchev was plotting to destroy the British Empire, they would get a reply, um, thank you very much for your ex excellent insights in the world affairs. Uh, that, that, sort of, that sort of very polite reply. Uh, okay, you don't man. get much of a sense of his own, uh, um, to go back to your phrase you used a moment ago, state of mind, his mentality, you don't get in much of a sense of how he felt personally? Uh, only occasionally. I mean, I think he saw a lot of the letters. Um, he didn't see all of them, but he saw a lot of them, mm -hmm. um, which is very different, for instance, to the situation with Obama, who got 10,000 letters a day and a secretariat which selected 10 letters a day to show him, which he read. Well, Menzies read a lot, a much higher proportion than that, uh, I think. Um, he, occasionally, he occasionally intervenes um, quite, um, it depends who's writing, uh, I suppose. Um, there's a letter from A.L. Rouse, the English historian who wrote various works about Churchill and sent Menzies copies. And Menzies wrote, wrote to him some, some very interesting comments about his view of history, about how history, in Menzies' view, was something made by great individuals. It wasn't the history of social movements. It wasn't the history of, uh, you know, broad tendencies, it was made by individuals. Of course, I'm sure he was thinking of himself. Um, and there's a, there are other sorts of letters, if they were, there were other sorts of letters, if they really impressed him, he would, he would reply in a more personal vein. For instance, I remember one uh, towards the end of his term, um, which was very uh, flattering and referred to Menzies' historical role, how he would go down in history and compared him to other previous British prime ministers, including Pitt the Younger, for example, in the 1790s. That was exactly what, you know, exactly the kind of thing that would, you know, um, massage Menzies' ego. And he, said, he replied to that and he said, this is the most impressive letter I've received in a long time. <laughs> and thank you very much for your, you know, great perception, etc." Thanks. That's absolutely delightful. Um, Lisa. <laughs> Um, I just uh, I don't want to hear Naomi's questions about the petitions, but um, I've, it's so interesting. I was really struck by. Uh, sorry, can you be quiet down there, please? Um, sorry, someone decides to make noise as soon as I ask a question um, about uh, John's missing letter and about what that does. That you know, what what does that mean about this corpus? I'm really interested in the notion that Menzies or someone would decide that a certain sort of address to the representative of the people was not worthy of notice so not worthy of notice that it would be returned. I'd love to hear your comments on what that tells you about who gets to have to, who gets to participate in this intimate conversation. But it also makes me want to hear a bit more about interventions because our people write in all from all over the empire and in it's really unusual, we, we can never quite figure out the criteria, but often there is personal intervention. So the ministry running the colony on behalf of the king will actually say, okay, I want someone to go and look into this particular claim, which is usually, you know, about loss of property, you know, that sort of thing. Is there, I mean, this is obviously a different sort of conversation, which you know, also says something about the 20th century state as opposed to the 19th century imperial state. But I guess I'm just asking for your reactions on that. I'm, finally, I'm really curious about the absence of any talk about Indigenous rights because, you know, I did a bit of work a few years ago with a student on a case from the 1950s and it became pretty clear that Hazlitt was terrified of humanitarian critique. 
but that was probably happening in the press, right? It probably had a different forum. There were only a few personal letters, and I don't know if they came. They certainly, maybe they didn't go to Menzies. They probably went straight to Hazlock. But I'm curious about, you know, when people decide to address him as opposed to other parts of government. Um, anyway, lots of things, but um, yeah. You can take or leave any of those if you want to comment. Well, uh, I mean, anything, uh, letters will be passed to, on to Hazlook. I mean, Menzies didn't always feel like responding to them all um, pers necessarily, except in a very brief way. Um, things were passed on. And if, if, if something came um, from wherever it was in, in, in the in the world or the empire, if, if if it was appropriate, he would he would just delegate it. He would just pass it on to 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 the ministry or or the or the office responsible. Um, as for the letter, I, I'm still wondering about the letter sent back. Of course, there's no. I'm, I'm just very surprised by that, and I, I can't I can't believe that it was a common practice. I mean, that there is a file uh, which was opened up. Toward, towards the end of the term, which is the no reply file, where letters which were not going to be replied to were shuffled into it. They weren't sent back. They were just, you know, they were kept on file and forgotten. And that was the, that was the destiny of letters which were too hard to answer or which were just, or were too insulting to warrant an answer. If a letter was too abusive, Menzies would just say, ignore it. Was there a sense that he would have he would have seen the abusive letter, or would somebody have prevented him yeah, from reading? Yes, because the sec the secretaries were often didn't know exactly how to respond, and they would they would regularly refer letters to Menzies saying how this uh, this person is really you know over the top. How should I write? How should I answer this? Uh, and Menzies might say, ignore it. Right. You see this dialogue going on. It's scribbled on the on the letters or on the back of the envelopes. The secretary would write a note. Menzies would re briefly reply. It's incredible. I mean, it's the same often with the colonial office record, uh, records, but this incredible material culture, not only of, of a letter, but the way in which a letter was um, shuffled around to different departments. Uh, Ruth, I think you're next up. Oh, thanks, uh, Martin. Your work's been really inspiring, actually, for my work with the way displaced persons petitioned the authorities, um, that form of writing upwards, which is very different, but it's still been really important to my work. But I, I just wanted to ask whether women were, whether women's letters to Menzies um, during this period, what sort of concerns they were raising and whether you noticed a shift over that 17 year span as well? Um, I, okay, I can, there's several ways of answering that. My, my, just, my general impression um, is that uh, letters from women tended to be more autobiographical. They, women tended to give more of their life story than the men were sometimes prepared to do. That, that's one thing. Secondly, we talked talk before about the, the importance of pensions. Many of the, uh, the letters about pensions came from women um, because the situation I think discriminated the situation about with the pensions and the means test made this almost inevitable. Um, women were entitled for pensions at an earlier age, and they tend, you know, dem the demographic reality was that they tended to live longer. Most of those letters were therefore were almost inevitably going to come from women, and a lot of the tales of uh, hardship um, and difficulties were from were from women who were especially widows uh, I would say who were finding it very difficult to make ends meet and I remember one in particular which I will just mention from a woman I think in in the city Melbourne who wrote a very chatty letter to Menzies about and she said dear Mr Menzies I did a very silly thing yesterday um, and the silly thing she did was to uh, want to have a, a little bit of steak for dinner. So she went out to buy some steak and she thought she'd had enough, she had enough money 
to buy enough meat for two two meals to last her two days, but she was wrong. She only had enough really for one. And so she was writing to Menzies because she had nothing more to eat. And she says, I've only got a soup cube and a dessert spoon full of tea to last me until the next pension day. And that's one example. There are several letters of that sort and they, and they, come, uh, and they come from women. Sounds like an amazing source for a more intimate history of this period as mm. well. It's great. Mm. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Thanks. Please do. Uh, Anne? Oh, unmute yourself. Uh, Martin, this is so interesting. Um, loving it. <laughs> and I, I don't know that this is any much help, but, um, you know, as you know, the pension really did not shift all through this period. Um, you know, Menzies hardened his heart. Um, and it's so interesting, as you said at the outset, that the enemy don't write to him. He's, he's at the people who are, the pensioners who are writing to him are mostly liberal voters. Yes. And for what it's worth, I just thought it might be interesting for us to think about the fact that really the old age pensioners and later the invalid pensioners were really a, an important and one of the very first welfare self-help groups ever to emerge in Australia. And they were strongly associated with the union movement and the Labor Party. So in one sense, I mean, when we, you've really focused the people who were forgotten by Menzies himself, uh, his yeah. own forgotten. So I just wonder that that broader political um, uh, scenario might help us to explain, you know, why it was, I mean, you know, by the time they discovered poverty in the 60s with all the journalists and Henderson and so on, you know, mm. um, it was a very, at best, topsy-turvy system. At worst, it was, you know, as you say, starvation uh, pensions. So I just think it's, um, you know, you've, you've shed uh, light on those on his own side of politics who, who wanted to shift him. But I wonder whether his resistance is also uh, explicable in terms of the people who were actually going much more public. Well, that may be so, um, that, that may well be so. I mean, uh, he, did, he did for a while give those, give those complainers uh, a reason. He's, he did say it's really too expensive. It's going to cost, you know, this much money, this many millions. And of course, the the, 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 the cost went up year by year. The, the, the potential cost went up year by year. Um, he did. He was patient enough to explain that to people. But as I as I said, um, as I said, I think to Lisa, uh, to, towards at the end of the Towards the end of the term, in, which would be the mid '60s, um, the secretary was just shuffling those pension pensioners' letters into the no reply file, mm -hmm. and there was not even a, you know, not even an acknowledgement, uh, which I've sort of thought was very sad and disappointing, really. Um, but 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 that that was the case. Pensions were, of course, increased, but um, as you know very well, but only in a very sort of piecemeal fashion and there was a there was a refusal to do from to do anything about introducing a national insurance scheme which the letters often referred to and they referred to the english model as a as something which australia should seriously consider yeah no, thank you <laughs> uh, we have time for a couple more questions um peter and ian you still have your hands up so i couldn't tell if you're are those the second questions or still the first question in the meantime we have james james over to you um, I've just not put my hand down, that's all. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Martin. I think that's a, a really, really fascinating uh, paper. I have two questions. One of them is about, if you could speak a little more about, um, if there are any letters that particularly moved Menzies in a particular way, like did anyone manage to sort of uh, shift his own barometer? And I'm also interested if, if there are any kind of ongoing correspondence or people who wrote a lot to Menzies versus people who just wrote one. Okay, um, I, I, I don't think any letter changed his mind on anything. <laughs> yes, uh, um, right. uh, I, I can't see that. Um, and as I, as I hinted before, I think the ones that really um, 
moved him to reply uh, personally and at length were the, were the most flattering ones. Um, um, so. Now, but the other question you asked is very interesting. Um, the majority of writers wrote one letter only, um, but there were some uh, serial offenders also, um, <laughs> as you sort of, uh, your question implied, James. Um, there were one or two uh, in particular. Um, I'm thinking of a, a woman in um, on, a, on a dairy farm in Queensland who wrote 20 times a year or so. Um, and the, the, quite interesting letters. She wrote on any subject, any and every subject. I think anything that she's seen in the newspaper that interested her, she wrote a comment on to Menzies. And um, she didn't always get a reply because the letters that she wrote came in so fast, the secretariat didn't have time. So they kind of collected them into a dozen or dozen, a packet of a dozen, and then replied. Um, <laughs> This was a this was uh, this this was a, a woman who clearly wanted to play a public role. Mm -hmm. um, she, she she wrote um, to Menzies and said, "I'm I'm your uh, I'm your welfare minister. <laughs> I'm potentially your welfare minister." She was really asking for some kind of public role, either in journalism or in politics. She wanted. Uh, you know, she wanted Menzies to recognize her, to recognize her advice, um, to give her some sort of job, um, I think. But of course, that never happened. Um, uh, and she she wrote what I call a, a, a tribune letter, a tribune letter, meaning she's she cast herself as the voice of the people. She said, I'm telling you what people are thinking. I'm. I'm representing. Uh, I'm representing the, the popular opinion, and and uh, you know, and you need me. You need me. You need me in your government, and you need a women's a woman's voice. She even said that at one point, although that wasn't the main theme of her of her request. Um, that 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 was a that was a persistent writer, who a very frustrated one. Um, who who never really got what she wanted, but 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 there were one or two very persistent um, correspondents like that. Mm. David and then Daniel very quickly, and then we'll have to close. Me? Yes. Uh, oh, David. Uh, hello. Hi. John already asked about foreign policy in the years you mentioned. There's such a lot happening in Southeast Asia, particularly yes. Indonesia, Singapore, Malaya, and Vietnam. Yes. There, were his the people who wrote to him interested in these topics? Yes, they? yes. I would say in general, the level of interest in in, in foreign affairs was not great, um, except for when the South African issue came up. But yes, there was an interest, certainly in uh, uh, in Malaya, and later on. Of course, the Ind Indonesia, um, and also there was uh, this. The an this comes into the anti-communist rhetoric very much. So, anti-communism had several phases, in my view, in the letters. It starts off as a kind of a war against the trade unions in Australia. Then, after the the Petrov affair and the the mid fifties, the Soviet Union comes into the picture much more. It's it's a it's a communist plot being orchestrated from Moscow. But then, but then after that, it communism has an Asian face in the letters. It's Red China and it's the Indonesian uh, Indonesian affairs also, uh, and they certainly do figure quite um, prominently. And there's a great fear of what's going on. Thank you very much. Daniel. Oh, hi, um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I was really interested about the mention of the Japanese scroll in the archives. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in linguistics, so I have a lot of interest in Australian language planning and policy. Um, so Menzies was in power during a time of considerably large migration from Eastern and Southern Europe, um, which brought a lot of cultural diversity to the Australian landscape, but wasn't really 
accepted in the national discourse of Australian identity. Um, so I was just wondering um, how, how many of the letters were from non-English backgrounds? I'm guessing most were from Anglo-Celtic backgrounds, but, um, but how many of them were there? And did the concerns that they raised differ from their white Anglo counterparts and were they dealt with differently? Yes, uh, you're, you're, you're right. Your guess is right. Most of the, most of, uh, the letters are, are not from, uh, most of the letters are from Anglo-Australian born correspondents, but that, yes, there are some, there are, um, I, I couldn't tell you quantitatively speaking, but there are um, some from recent immigrants and recent immigrant associations um, from uh, Hungarians, for instance, um, especially after 1956. Um, uh, and not all, not all of them are in English. I mean, the secretary's got things translated from uh, from Polish or from Russian or who, for whatever language it was. Um, they're, sometimes they're asking for a favor. Sometimes they're asking for money because somebody is, uh, is having serious problems and can't get a job. Um, a lot of them are writing about communism from Eastern Europe and um, they're more, you know, those that body of correspondents are more anti-communist than the than the Anglo-Australians. They're quite, you know, violently so, because, and they would they would say this because they had first-hand experience of living under a communist regime, and they literally sometimes they knew where the bodies were buried, uh, and they were telling Menzies that that they could help him in his struggle against against communism they because they had special knowledge of it uh thanks so much you've just we're just running over time now so i will close it there um the next history books at unsw event will be a round table on ruth valence new book destination elsewhere displaced persons in their quest to leave europe and that's going to be on the 18th of November at 6pm and I'll send a link uh, out to everybody um, who wants to register. Uh, but I would just like to really thank um, Richard White and also Martin Lyons. Thank you so much for this really rich and fascinating discussion. I so enjoyed reading your book, Martin. And like Ruth, it's really influential. It's just a way of analysing and thinking about this process of writing upwards. So thank you and a round of applause from uh, your audience. I'm sorry that we couldn't meet in person. Um, but I'll close the meeting there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Naomi. And thanks, Richard, too. Thanks, Matt.